Welcome, welcome back to Living Well. I am so excited to have you as audience today as we discuss striving or surviving um, to thrive in. I just want to, before we start, just to remind everyone that our program is for educational purposes only. If you have any medical concern, make sure you check with your doctor, your, um, get back with your doctor with any concerns you might have. We are here to support everyone in living a healthy lifestyle. So today we have a presenter who was with us before, Mr. Clarence Brung. Mr. Clarence Brung is a industrial psychologist. He has a master's degree in industrial psychology. He's also a certified life coach. With these two combination, a psychologist and a healthy life coach, works just perfectly for Mr. Brown. He has a practice, um, a healthy living practice that he does. And if you want to get in touch with him at the end of the program, he can give you your information on that, how to get in touch with him. And we are so glad to have you back, Clarence, to discuss um, today, surviving to thriving. I'm looking forward to hear what you have to say. And without any further ado, we're going to turn the program over to you, Mr. Brown. Welcome. Thank you so much, Emmeline. And greetings to everyone. On April 26, I called one of my tenants in Tigger. His name is Carl. He's a medical student at the University, American University of Antigua. I called him in Tuesday, I think it was the 26th. I said, Carl, I've been trying to reach you for a while. How are you doing? How are you doing, sir? He said, Mr. Brown, I'm thriving. Mr. Brown, I'm doing really well. I'm thriving. I to speak with Carl. I spoke with a few other, other students, also students. And we heard from them, we're just surviving. We're just surviving. We're just surviving. We're just trying to survive. But the response from Kyle was significantly different. Kyle said, Mr. Brown, I'm thriving. See, uh, my, my response to how you're doing is very similar to Kyle. And I walk into the YMCA this week with my four year old granddaughter who's with me. The attendant at the front desk often says, Mr. Brown, how you doing? I say, I'm the next one. When I was the morning, I step into the supermarket and I get to the checkout counter and the clerk says, how are you doing, sir? My response always is, I'm excellent. Now, I want you to understand, this is not a pretext. The excellent comes really from how I feel inside. And maybe to create some context, I want you to understand who's in with you today. See, in April 6th of 2015, I stepped out of a school board meeting, got into my car, and started my commute home. 10 minutes into my commute, I lost control of my car. I take my uh, right side front tire left, and as a result, I have a head on collision. Minutes later, probably uh, half an hour or so later, maybe an hour later, I found myself on a gurney in the back of a paramedic truck. I still don't know what it means, but I heard a paramedic um, on the radio saying, Valley Hospital, Code Blue, Code Blue, we're transporting an African American bill, 56 or 56 at that time. And after an hour or two later, I was being I had someone introduce themselves to me by the name of Dr. Sparrow. She says, Mr. Brown, I am the emergency room attendant physician tonight. And after season, Please continue your story, Mr. Brown. Okay, then. April 26th. I made a call to one of my tenants in Antigua, who is a student at the um, American University of Antigua by the name of Kyle. I hadn't heard from him in a few weeks. 
And it's just by my kind of routine that I would call and check in the students to see how they're doing and how they're performing in their classes. And I called him, I said, he said, Mr. Brown. And I said, Kyle, how are you doing? How are you doing, sir? He said, Mr. Brown, I'm thriving. And I tell you that sound excellent. And the reality is that that has not always been the conversation with Kyle. That's many time I've called Kyle when he said, Mr. Brown, I'm just really struggling. I'm just really struggling. And many of you students, that's the conversation. We just survived and just survived. But I don't know what was happening in Kyle's life in that particular day, that particular point in time. But in his mind, he was doing great. And his response was, I'm thriving. I think his response pretty mirrors my response when I walk into the YMCA with my four-year-old granddaughter getting ready to play some pickleball. And the uh, gentleman at the front desk says, how are you doing today, sir? My response usually, I'm doing excellent. When I'm at this grocery market and I get up to the cashier and the cashier say, how are you doing today, sir? My response is, I'm excellent. And that response is not a contrived response. It's just kind of what comes out from inside because truly the way that I feel is excellent. But to give some context, I want you to understand who's speaking to you there. Because this man whose response on a daily basis, I'm doing excellent and feel excellent. And April 6th of 2015, stepped out of a school board meeting, jumped into his car, 10 minutes into his commute home, had a problem with my right side front tire that caused me to lose control of my vehicle, which caused me to have a head-on collision. Probably an hour later, after the collision, I was in the back of a paramedic church. I can still see the words in the paramedic church that said, rescue five and a gurney, and I could hear the um, one of the paramedics on the radio it's called Valley Hospital, Valley Hospital. We have a 56-year-old African-American, cold blue, cold blue, cold blue, cold blue. I still don't understand what that means. An hour or two later, while in the emergency room, I, was, I had a doctor introduce herself to me. She said, Mr. Brown, I'm Dr. Sparrow. I'm the attending emergency room physician tonight. And after a series of follow, I want you to follow my finger with your eyes, follow my fingers, follow my finger with your eyes. Okay, take your finger, I want you to take your finger and touch your nose. Take your finger and touch my finger and after her moving her finger back and forth and all these finger tests. And next was give me a smile, Mr. Brown, why don't you give me a smile? Come on, give me, give me a big smile right now. And I was later sent to for a CAT scan, came back, and perhaps I would say that night they did every test possible that the insurance would pay for. And after all the testing and all of the commotion in the emergency room, I was being wheeled into ICU. When I spent three about three weeks in ICU. And in the course between the emergency, emergency room examinations and all of the um, examinations that were done in ICU, they decided that I had what they labeled a free stroke. They labeled it a free stroke because they declared that when the air bag hit my head, it was so forceful that it caused a line in my current cardiac tear. And while when the lining was healing, my clock went to my brain, and that caused me to have suffer ischemic stroke. While in the hospital, doing my devotions, the Lord introduced me to Lamentation chapter three, perhaps verse twenty to twenty-five, which said, "It is of the Lord's mercy while we're not consumed. The Lord's mercy is in you every morning." And for someone laying in ICU who has been told that they had a stroke, that passage meant to me that I was alive at that time because of God's mercy. And God's mercies are new every morning it meant to me that the incident that occurred in April 6th didn't have to be a life sentence for me. 
because God's mercies were available for every challenge that I would face during that period and, and my recoveries. About three weeks later, it was time for me to leave the hospital after I had spent some time in a regular room. I remember the doctors saying to me, Mr. Brown, where's your bedroom at home? I said, my bedroom is on the second floor. He said, whatever you do, I don't want you to go up to second I don't want you to go up to the second floor. For those of, those of you who know me like I'm a man, you know that the first thing I probably did when I got home, you could probably imagine just walk up the stairs, and that's exactly what I did. I was capable to ensure I was holding all the rails coming up and coming down. The first thing I did was I went up the stairs. A few weeks later, I was told by a psychologist who I respected because he was a sage. He said, Mr. Brown, so far what the doctors have done, they've worked on your hardware, they've worked on your brain, they've looked at your brain, they've looked at the hardware. I would recommend very strongly that you go see someone who would look at your software to see how your software is now performing after in the incident to your hardware. After great search, we found a neurological psychologist by the name of Dr. Good. And finally got an appointment and spent four hours with Dr. Cook going through extensive testing. Mr. Brown, I'm going to read these numbers to you. I want you to repeat the numbers and the sequence that I read them. Mr. Brown, I'm going to tell you some words. I want you to, to, I want you to repeat the words to me. Mr. Brown, I'm going to read you a story. And she'd read the story. I want you to tell me the facts of the stories. And after four hours of those types of things. Mr. Brown's here are some blocks. I want you to create these shapes just like the shapes are right now. In four hours of going through all of that and creating shapes and shapes, some of the shapes I couldn't create. She sat down and she gave me a, her, her diagnosis. He says, Mr. Brown, I'm afraid because of the insult to your, the insult to your brain. And she began to give me the list of things that I will not be able to do going in the future. One of which she says, Mr. Brown, I'm gonna recommend that you not continue working as the executive that you are today because your executive function has been so much challenged. And she then went through a laundry list of things that I could do, would be able to do or not be able to do. But because of my fate and because of my orientation, I decided there and then that I would be more than a stroke survivor that I would be better after my stroke than I was before my stroke. And so for me then, after my stroke, I created a new vision. And that vision for me was to be better after than I was before. And I would say that vision would be that I would strive, not, be, not in spite of my stroke, but because of my stroke. And so what I did then, I then began to set goals, around every deficit that they said that I would have. They said I'd have some deficit with my memories. I set some goals around that. I had some issue with my peripheral vision. I set some goals around that. And every deficit, then I set goals. And based on those goals, I started working by the grace of God to make some make improvements there. I then also realized, in fact, I remember every Sabbath I'd go to church and there was a young man doing praise and worship would stand up and he would stretch his hands high up in the air. And before my incident, I wondered why he was doing all of that. But after my incident, I clearly understood that Jerome was standing and stretching his hands high because he understood that he didn't have to have the ability to do that. And so for me then, each day after my stroke and analysis and prognosis, I have decided that I would thrive in all of my relationships, that I would try to ensure that I was at peace with all men. And most importantly, I understood clearly Got a merry heart, do it good like a medicine. What a broken spirit drive. In fact, in my work with, with my clients,
clients. Very often I found that many of my clients who were suffering from some new diagnosis, whether it be um, rheumatoid arthritis and, and some others, have had a broken heart experience and that that broken heart experience was enough to trigger the incident of the diagnosis that they were suffering from. So I believe it's critical that we strive, we, that we strive not only that we, we're not only can survive it. I think as children, as children of the living sector, we are to be more than survivors, we are to be thrivers. To be clear now, to be thriving doesn't mean that we're always happy and we don't have issues. It just means that we have an attitude and an attitude that we see the good. We see the good, we see the good versus the bad. We see opportunities, not just the challenges. And with balance, yes, yes we understand that there are challenges, but we, and we can talk to, about the challenges, but we're just quick to speak about the opportunities. Positive psychology has done some studies in the area of thriving versus surviving. And what they have found that there are some domains in which we can focus on that can cause us to thrive. Those domains entail positive emotions. And we all probably know people who we love to be around because we know when we're around them that their emotions are going to be positive. And then we, we know that those who are always more downers, there's always going to be something wrong, more negative. And so forth. And I think we all agree that we tend to enjoy being around us with positive emotions. More importantly, we feel better ourselves when we have positive emotions. Studies are also showing that positive emotions also have some associated benefits. People who tend to have more positive emotions tend to live longer and have better well-being, better health. Other things in the area of um, thriving is engagement. Just being engaged. I have employed, I've had employees who have told me, Mr. Brown, I just come to work. I have no relationship with anybody. I just come to work and go home. I don't, I don't get involved with anyone. And that's one way to live. And I say, if we're going to, get up and go to work, then the chance that it makes more sense to be engaged and to be someone who is interested in the people around you, having consent, concern, knowing what about them. And what the, what the study shows is it's not so much the work that you do, but the meaning that you give to the work that you do. I always remember the story that's told of three men, three men that are doing what you call laying bricks. Stranger comes up to all three of them. He said, sir, what are you doing? So the first man says, sir, what are you doing? That gentleman's response was, I'm laying bricks. He said to the second guy, sir, what are you doing? His response was, I'm building a wall. The third guy, he said, what are you doing? The third guy said, I'm building the walls for a hospital where people can come and get well. Clearly three individuals doing the same activity, but with different level of meaning for each of those. So again, the domains that um, lead to thriving, engagement, positive emotions, a sense of accomplishment. I always say to my clients, set yourself up, set yourself up for success. What I mean by that is, if you're gonna start a walking program, don't start at 10 miles, do five, do, do two, do one, and be successful at that. If you want to start eating better, don't go from zero to 100. Set yourself up with some success so you can begin to say, you know, I'm doing better, I'm making improvements. And life tends to have a series of improvements, and it's just a better sense we live that I might know that you can make some improvements. The other areas, the, the other domain is positive relationships. And I don't know about you, but when I walk into the gym and they say, Mr. Brown, how are you doing that? I say, excellent. How that excellent system? I feel like I have no issues with any of my fellow men. 
no strife. Those who I may have a concern with, I've had a conversation, we try to come to some solutions. Most importantly, and those who I can help, I have a neighbor across the street, she's 80, 81 years old. When I go by and visit and she complains about just her daughter not giving her the attention, such as coming by to bring her a good meal and such. And when I can call her and say, hey, I'm out, is there anything that you would like? And she said, you know, I would like to have a salad. And I come back to my granddaughter and take the salad over to her. And she's so um, thankful as a result of that. I know that's been me, that's many of the that's been me. She impressed me the last time I visited her as I was leaving. I just touched, squeezed her hand and said, have a good night. She said, you know, you can pray with me if you like. I wondered, wow, where did that come from? But, you know, I think it is true that people really don't care so much about how much we know, how, how safe and knowledgeable we think we are, as much as they are concerned about how much we care. And I think one way to add meaning to our life is to be the individual in the room who is the most caring. There was a statement in the, in the in NPR this week. They were talking about um, Ian, uh, Moss, Ian Moss and just other individuals like that. But the question was, what do you do when you are the richest person in the room? I think it was a religious station. Because then the other question that came, what do you do when you are the most important person, when you are the most important person in the room? And then the speaker pivoted to, Jesus was the most important person in the upper room. What did he do? I think you know the answer. He served. And so we can find great meaning in life by serving others when there's an opportunity for us to serve a negative things. And so I think as we begin to focus in these domains of life, positive emotions, and I think we all have different personalities, but to kind of be more the person who sees the glass as half full versus half empty. And sometimes we have to, some of us have to work more with that than others. But as we tilt ourselves towards being more positive, to see, to see the good more than we see the bad. As we tilt ourselves to looking at our relationships and saying, well, what can I do to improve this relationship? Sometimes it's difficult to fix relationships because you can only control one, one aspect of the relationship and that is you're, 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 you're part of it. But I believe that through the power of prayer and through the uh, wisdom that the Lord gives us, that for many of those relationships that have been a stress and strain have been a grain upon us so we can seek wisdom to improve those relationships. I guess my argument here is recognize that we thrive more with positive relationships and negative relationships. Therefore, it is worthwhile to do what we can by God's grace. And I understand that my admonition is not that we can do all these things in our own strength but that we can do all things to Christ to strengthen us. And so as we focus more on having positive relations, positive emotions, positive relationships, having accomplishments, setting ourselves up for success, not being too hard on ourselves, setting goals that we can know that we can achieve and exceed, being engaged in all the circles where we have a, the word best to be part of. I like what, what um, I think it's on um, the Zabaja says that Jesus mingled with men as if someone concerned about their well-being. I think that's a calling that we have. Some of you listening to me have lost your call have lost sight of your particular assignment. 
that we become aligned with our calling, as we become in tune with the, the daily assignment that the Lord may have upon us and begin to align ourselves with those assignments at the end of the day, I think we realize that we're making a difference and making a difference. That we begin to feel that we begin to move from surviving to thriving. And so those are some of the key elements of the domains that move that moves us from surviving to thrive. And I think it's it's not enough to just feel you end every day. So I survived another day. But indeed, by God's grace, to be able to go from surviving to thriving. All right, so those are those those are the key points that I would share with you going from surviving to thriving. And even in even in pandem pandemic times, I believe that these domains are areas that we can focus on. And so at Emily, whenever time it's ready, we're ready yeah. to open for questions. I'm ready, I'm available to deal with questions if we're there at this time. Yeah, wonderful. You know, Clarence, every time you come on this platform, you always give us that opportunity to do some introspective, you know, of our lives yeah. so that we can see and improve our lives. I love the topic surviving to thriving. How many mm -hmm. times we have gone through the day just surviving mm -hmm. instead of thriving? Because yes, yes. we have, you know, you know, as you said, God's mercy. God's mercy is new every morning. Yes. And if we just start thinking about that every morning mm -hmm. we get up, if yes. we shall just start saying mm -hmm. to myself, um, you know, that God has given me another day and I need to look and see what I can do so to try and not just survive. I, you know, okay. you brought us some, so much important points for us to um, um, apply to our lives, to have a positive attitude. Attitude being positive is so very important. Have a positive attitude by being positive. It adds longer life to our, it gives us, you know, uh, help us to live longer. You know, we all want to live longer and healthier. Um, it gives us a sense of accomplishment. You know, having a sense of accomplishment is so positive. It makes you want to thrive. Um, mm -hmm. Set yourself goals. Don't set yourself up for failure. Set yourself up goals. Show kindness. It's so, you know, when Christ was on this earth, his duty was to help others. And if we can do that, it will bring so much joy to our lives and have positive relationship. So much wonderful points you pointed out. I, it's just so exciting. And I am um, going to follow from the audience if they have any questions for you in regards to what you just presented. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was it's excellent. Thank you, Emily. And I want to kind of highlight a few things that you emphasized. One, I believe that we're called to be the head and not the tail. <laughs> to me, to be the head and not the tail is to be thriving and not just surviving. Mm -hmm. Most importantly, some of you are saying, Mr. Brown, you, you're asking me to do more for others. I'm doing so much already. I've done so much and I've been hurt and hurt and hurt. But here's one of the things we know as, as psychologists that we don't get hurt doing things for others unless we expect something. And but if we have, if we do without expectations, it's very difficult to be hurt. We're more often hurt by doing for others and being disappointed by the, how they respond because we do with an expectation. But if you do without expectations, mm -hmm. you almost never feel used or feel hurt. What a one, that is so true. Yeah. I have seen that happen, people expecting certain things from you and you know you don't even realize it. And then the next thing you know, oh, you hurt my feeling and you weren't trying to hurt anyone's feeling. So, mm -hmm. you know, but that, that is so true. One, um, someone said um, um, they would like us to text the list of points that you just made. Um, they were very impressed by all the different points you made. Um, I'm sure we can get back with, who is that, Linda? Yeah. Yes, we can do that for you, Linda. 
um, all the different points that he made. Excellent. We just need to take these points <laughs> and make it part of our daily lives. When we get up in the morning, get up with a positive attitude. No matter what might be happening around us, we have to stay positive. And with just that attitude of staying positive will take you a long way. Emmeline, for a long time, we used to say that your attitude will determine your altitude. I now oh say God. your attitude will determine your longevity. Mm. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I, um, I, I agree. Definitely. Yeah, the attitude really affects even our performance. So you made, you made an example of people going to work and say they don't uh, you know, associate with anyone. They just go to work and go home. They do their job, but believe it or not, our attitude and whether we associate with people or not also affects our performance. So you know, we may think that we're on that island by ourselves and we don't need anybody, but it really mm -hmm. does affect how productive you are and how effective you are and what quality of work you do. And I will share just a, my, a personal tip. What took me from the little Adventist school, St. Croix Seven Adventist School, to being one of the um, key executives at both Citibank and Sprint, Sprint was that for me every year I set my, my, my mission was to make a difference, to make a difference for my team, to make a difference for the company, to make a difference from my boss. And so I think when we, when we have a mission to make a difference where we are, in fact, I, I even said my, my, my mission was to make a difference at home, make a difference at work, make a difference at church and make a difference in my community. And I think that we're called to be those kind of people, people who make a difference because of how much we care, not just because of how much we know, how much we know, but how much we care. Definitely. Yes. Because see, I should... Yeah. Others, others can, uh, others, others can know more than more can can have can be more knowledgeable. Others can be more experienced. Others can have more money, can have more things. But if we have the right heart, then they we can be that we can almost win mm -hmm. in how much we care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here, and I think we make a difference. Yeah, that's so true. That's so true. Um, hey, anyone have a question for Mr. Braun? This is Juliet. I have a bit of a personal question. Uh -huh. um, you said one of the things they, they totally think you could do and you cannot do. Uh -huh. One thing you work on was your memory. Mm -hmm. What did you do to improve your memory? Well, if someone called me and said, hey, my telephone number is X, Y, or Z, I never wrote it down. I just kind of worked in remembering it. If I went to the store and they gave me a code, I didn't write the code down. I just worked in just trying to remember the code. I just, what I said, I put my mind to work. Mm -hmm. I, 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 names, I would try, I would remember people's names. Well, it was always a practice of mine to remember people's names. I would try to remember people's names. And for example, if I show up at the YMCA to play pickleball and someone was missing yesterday, I'd recognize that they were missing. And they said, hey, I was missing because I had a doctor's appointment. The next time I see them, I'd say, hey, how was your appointment? Or oh, they had an issue? So I just kind of put my heart into everything. And I find in that that when you begin to stretch your mind and allow your mind to work, I think the, the, more, the less inward focus we are and the more outward we focus we are, then everything opens up. Mm -hmm. And in fact, recently I did that same um, exam that um, Dr. Cook did back in 2015. 2015, and the results of my most recent neurological exam was, Mr. Brown, you're showing improvement in every area. And I said, I told her before about my lifestyle, I said, and she said, I said, you know, I think my lifestyle is making a difference even in my neurological response. She says, I have to agree with you that lifestyle has really made the difference. Lifestyle is really making a difference all around. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, yes, that, that, that is so true. You know, what we put into our bodies is so important because we are what we eat, yeah. So you made a special effort to expand your memory. You made a special effort to focus and to remember things. 
And that's how you were able to exercise your memory and help you to grow. Well, Emmeline, I would even say this. I would say that the Lord knew that I needed to make some changes, even mm -hmm. though I was living a vegetarian diet and all that. Mm -hmm. But he knew that I need to make changes and to take my self-care to a higher level. And he blessed, him, blessed me with this church, with this stroke. Mm -hmm. And as a result of this stroke, I took my whole life, lifestyle health up to a, another level. And as a result, I think I've seen just dividends in every aspect of my life. Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Josephine, you had a question? <laughs> I was just saying for those of us who may not have some of the experience that Mr. Brown is talking about, um, be the best, wherever you go, do your best. We can pray to God to, to provide us some divine appointments. That word is used a lot in the theological circles of divine appointments. Ask God to put you, put somebody to meet you or you meet somebody or put you in a place where you can prove your God-given talents or help somebody with something. Those divine appointments, God usually puts somebody in your way for you to minister to. I agree with that. I agree with that 100%. I like to just add, ask the Lord to open your eyes to those divine appointments because they're around yes. us everywhere. We just, if our eyes are open, we will see how many people can benefit from what we've been given in terms of this grace and this gospel and such. Yes, that's right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Let me yeah. just mention, Julia mentioned about, you know, how do you, well, there's two things that I want to mention. So one thing that I really like about Mr. Brown's uh, presentation is he made goals for himself. He didn't wait till the doctor say, you need to do this, this, and this. He took that ownership on himself and said, this is what I want to do. And I find that when we set goals for ourselves, it's, they're more, you know, they're achievable or you're more likely to do them. So I think that, you know, as we go through life, all of us should have some type of a personal mission statement and then goals that we're trying to achieve. So I always- fact, Julia, I always, I always, let me add in here. I want to say a self of self-determination. I, I would told my, I would say to my therapist, my visual therapist, and I'd say, I want you to not just do these exercises. I want you to show me how to do them myself. Mm -hmm. Whether it be the speech therapist, I said, I want you to show me how to do this, how to find these resources. So I didn't just wait to just do the treatment when I got to an appointment in office. I was doing them at home by myself all the time. So I say just a sense of, a sense of self-determination mm -hmm. that and, we will work harder on ourselves than anybody else will work upon us. And no, uh -huh. no one cares. Julia, I, uh, Julia, I hope I'm answering the question. No, uh -huh. one cares yeah, about you. no one cares about you like yourself. So when yeah, you that's right, that's right, that's right. You're sick and in the bed. There's nothing people mm -hmm. can do for you really other than pray for you, but there's things that you can do for yourself. Right, so yes. I think, you know, I, taking that, like you say, that self-determination is so really important. Having our own mission goal and actually on continuously, like he said, every time, every year, he'd say, I'm going to do better for this company. You notice he made that for himself. And I think we also can do that because God has given us such gifts and talents. But the other thing about the memory, which Julia had asked about, Many times we yeah. overload, overload our minds so we can't remember because we have too much in it <laughs> and we haven't made an intentional effort to remember things. So let's say I walk in the door with my keys and I go to turn off the alarm and, I, and I'm doing all these things just on automate, automatic, just doing things. Mm -hmm. And let's say I sit my keys somewhere that I normally don't sit them. I'm not going to remember because I'm so used to going to the alarm and doing certain things. So sometimes we're, we're multitasking. And the brain doesn't have time to really process what we need to remember. So, um, so I think we have to put challenge ourselves to look for landmarks, remember different things. Focus. And it's really focus. Yeah, focus is better to be focused than to be doing a thousand things. Best to do two two things well mm. at the end of the day than to say I got a hundred things done and none done well. Right. So mm. focus. Focus. Yeah. Focus. Wonderful. And, and perhaps I would say my, my secret sauce is this. My secret sauce is faith and works, <laughs> work wonders. <laughs> faith and work. 
faith by itself won't do it. Work by itself won't do it, but faith and work together do amazing things. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, yeah, yeah. I know, I know we have a, some one of our members, or, you know, audience have a life-changing experience. I know they want to to talk about. I know uh, my sister has been going to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and Clarence, just what you spoke about, setting goals, the, mm -hmm. being determined. Um, you know, I know Juliet has just gone through a transformation, and she wants to share just to. You know, a couple in the next two minutes, Jack, Jack, can you tell us? That's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Give us an example, a life example of what mm -hmm. has taken place in your life. Well, Juliet, I'm going to tell you, come join me because I say to myself, I'm a living witness. It sounds yes. like you're a living witness as well. Yes, right? she is. Yes. <laughs> Lord needs yeah. more living witnesses. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. And I tell you, you, there's room. There's, there's room, a lot of room for living witnesses. Yeah. So, Thank yes, you. Be a, live, be a living witness, my dear. You continue uh, to do that. Yeah. And I think, story. Tell others, tell others what the Lord has done for you. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have to tell people from what I see. I don't have to tell them. The uh -huh. reason why I say this, I walk one and a half mile every day. I don't care if it's raining or what. Good I would you. listen to the weather report <laughs> for that day. Ah. If it's going on, I normally walk in the evening after, you know, at five o'clock. If it's going on rain, I will walk before it rained, okay. lunchtime in the morning. I thought I was in my own world. I know that I am walking, so I do not, so I am not on meds. Mm. And speaking of that, I was on nine meds every day plus a shot once a week. Mm. I'm only on one pill right now. Wow. My doctor took me off of it. Anyhow, last Tuesday I was walking and this is what I do. I walk, I wear a glasses. I don't even wear my glasses when I'm walking. I don't want any load. I don't want anything to disturb <laughs> me. So I just have my key, a mask in my pocket and my phone. I walk with my head down because I do not want to see how far I have to walk because I might be discouraged. When I'm walking, I am focused, but I have to cross over like, driveways so i will look up to see if any car is coming mm. and there is a school and churches i pass on tuesday i was coming back home and i saw this car pull up in the school driveway did not even go and decide just pull up and this woman got out and approached me she was coming towards me i was in my own zone she said can I tell you something? I said, yes. Yeah. She said, I have seen your transformation. I did not think of Juliet and transformation. I said, transformation. She said, yes, my daughter and I, we drive this street all of the time. We have seen you lost so much weight. I didn't care if it was raining, if it was cold, I am walking, no excuse. And she just went off and had church on me about me. She said, you are inspiration. You are a blessing. Um, and now I am walking once a week because of you, because it's not called no more. And I'm thinking, me? <laughs> because all I was doing was walking for me. I was focused on me. Mm -hmm. I did not know other people was looking. Yesterday, I walked around lunchtime because I had to get my granddaughter at the end of the day. This woman yelled across the street, telling me I look good to keep it up. So when Clarence, you were saying to be a blessing to others, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I found out I did not even know what I was doing. I was wow. just thinking about me and other people. Then my boss is very nice. And because at times I would tell her, Jackie, it's going on rain. I'm going on walk. And mm -hmm. she will ask me how much pounds I lost. Then she asked me what I do. I did not know until this week. She told me, well, Juliet, I have berries every morning because that's what you do. 
<laughs> so I did not realize the impact I have on others. Congratulations, but, my dear. That is yeah, that sounds yeah. great. That sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, can can yeah. I can I give, can I share one other thing with you too? If sure. I go to the if I go to the supermarket and I am in the line and the clerk says, "Take care of me," I said, "Have you taken a walk today?" I say, "It's a nice day. Have you taken a walk?" I encourage everybody to walk. I don't even care if I know them. I just everybody. Have you taken a walk today? It's a nice day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the reason I do that is because Sister White says, "A short walk, even in winter." will do more for recovery than all the doctors, medicines, and hospitals in the world. And because I believe so strongly in that, I go to my doctor, I ask, Doc, have you been walking? Doc, have you been <laughs> doing walking program? And I'm encouraging. I'm like a walking evangelist. Sounds <laughs> like you. Sounds like yeah, you want to, yeah. but I'm a walking evangelist. I'm encouraging mm -hmm. everybody to walk. Everybody. Yeah, yeah, strangers, yeah. anybody. But the thing walk. about walking mm -hmm. is it is not stressful on the body. Not it is just simple. Then going to a gym and pumping iron, not that there's anything wrong with that, mm -hmm. but just putting one foot in front of the other and you go your own pace, you know? Yes. Yeah. 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 I, you know, it's, I'm just so proud of, you know, of Juliet because she was a nine medication plus an insulin shot mm -hmm. once a week. Mm -hmm. Now her doctor took her off insulin. She's no longer on insulin. Um, all her pills, you know, that she was taking, except for one blood pressure pill. And I told her, we can get that blood pressure um, at a better range. That way she doesn't even need that blood pressure pill. Mm -hmm. So it's coming. Uh, you'll be off all the medication eventually. Because God has given us a, 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 a book. God has given us a health message. And if we follow those, those his principles, we are going to be in so much better health. He wants us to prosper and be in good health. That's why he's, he gave us a diet that will um, that is suited for our body. When we eat these other things that are not suited for our body, it causes inflammation and causes problems. So, and one thing, Juliet, and keep it up. One thing I want to say about this is. The change does not take too long because I was doing this since November, the middle of November. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. So you're encouragement and inspiration for a lot of people. And that's why the Bible talks about that. We are the salt, we are the light of the world. You know, people are looking at us and we don't even realize that they are. So therefore we have to live a life that is always pleasing in his sight so that when others look on, they can see him through us you know this is such a wonderful topic today we can keep on talking forever but i know we have to That's come right. to an end and Emily, remember this end. just Emily, this last this last point mm -hmm. the bible gives us this prescription a merry heart do it good like a medicine right mm -hmm. a merry heart do it good like a medicine right that is so true merry That's heart why. Do it good like a medicine but a broken yeah. spirit dries the bone dries yeah. the bone yeah avoid so, Try to try to avoid the broken spirit as much as we can by God's grace, and when they come, just kind of know we got to get back to a merry heart. Wonderful, thank I you. Think that, I think that is a choice because it, it I sure purposely, is, yeah. I purposely choose to be happy and because whatever is going on in life, you could always find something positive. Something that is positive. that is true. Yes. That is so true. Thank you, Mr. Brown, for your words of encouragement. So let us remember to be positive, stay positive, um, set goals that you can accomplish, um, show kindness to others, um, have a positive relationship, and no matter what's going on in your life, keep a merry heart. That's it. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Hey, God bless you all. May the Lord bless you and keep each of you. Let his face to continue to shine upon you. Mm -hmm. Continue to lift up his countenance upon upon each of you and give you his peace. Thank you. you. Thank you, Clarence. Thank you so you much for your words of encouragement. Thank Excellent. You. Excellent. Thank Wonderful. You. Yes. So we're going to stop the recording.